Can I have your attention, please? Uh, thank you. So uh, what I want to do is I want to uh, just uh, uh, start with Gandhi today. Uh, and uh, let, me, let me remind you that uh, what I had done on uh, Monday was to take you up to uh, 1905 to the partition of Bengal and the Indian response to it, which was the Swadeshi movement. And you might recall that the chief significance of the Swadeshi movement from the standpoint from which I'm arguing is that it introduced the concept of mass politics into India, right? Uh, so that resistance was no longer a matter of being confined to a few elites belonging to the Indian National Congress, but rather that this was now going to be something that was going to characterize the country as a whole. And I might as, add as a little note that the entry of the masses into politics is a fairly recent phenomenon in that sense, even in European history. I mean, you could say that in Europe, I mean, the French Revolution, uh, to some extent, had something to do with that, right? Now, uh, let's turn back to the second half of the 19th century, to Mohandas Gandhi, known to the world as Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma is not uh, his name, it's a title, and it means the great soul, a, a title conferred on him supposedly by Rabindranath Tagore, a great Indian poet, uh, a contemporary of Gandhi. So Gandhi is, is born in 1869 in, in Western India, in, in a town called Porbandar, uh, in, uh, in Gujarat, Western India. Uh, and his initial schooling is there. Uh, he goes to London uh, for uh, his higher education, uh, you recall that I mentioned to you that most of the Indian uh, nationalist elite were credentialed in law. Gandhi is a very good illustration of that, right? So he goes to London um, and he's going to spend a few years there. He's going to come back to India, will attempt to make a living in India, will not be particularly successful. He stays in India for about a year and then due to circumstances which I can't describe over here and, and you know, I think I've already emailed you that I'm actually doing a a full length course on Gandhi next quarter, so you can see that there's obviously a great deal that what could add to the picture here, but due to various circumstances, he lands up in South Africa, and he's going to actually spend two decades in South Africa, all right? So it's, so it's not only India that claims Gandhi as their native son, South Africa does too, to some extent. I mean, if you listen to what Mandela has said about Gandhi, right? So he's going to spend 20 years there, and uh, very soon after his arrival, a few years after his arrival, he becomes involved in the struggle for rights that Indians want to claim. Because South Af Africa, of course, did, was not officially under apartheid, as we know the system of apartheid. That really comes into place officially much later on. But there was obviously discrimination against people who were colored, Indian, and the native Africans, right? And the European presence there is divided among the Boers, that is the Dutch, and the English, right? So Gandhi is going to spend many years in South Africa and he's going to essentially pioneer something which is really quite novel in the history of politics all over the world. And that is the idea of mass nonviolent resistance, okay? And he actually coins a word for his philosophy. He calls it Satyagraha, right? Uh, there's a book by him called Satyagraha in South Africa uh, where he narrates in considerable detail the struggle that he undertook. Okay? Satyagraha, which is made up of two Sanskrit words, Satya, which means truth, and Agraha, which means force. Right? So essentially Satyagraha is the force of truth. And what you confront your opponent with is Satyagraha. Now Satyagraha itself has a grammar, right? That is to say that it has lots of different components, which includes things like, you know, fasting, or what is called the hunger strike more often in the West, right? Boycotts, strikes, and so on. So that is its grammar of dissent. It has a philosophical grammar. Right? That is the elements, the philosophical elements that make up Satyagraha, which include Satya, right? truth, ahimsa. You have to go back to the idea of Jain, that the idea of ahimsa, which we had encountered when we were discussing Buddhism and Jainism. Right? Ahimsa means non-violence. Because of course what distinguishes Gandhi from everybody else is his absolutely rigorous principled adherence to the idea of non-violence. Right? 
And I want to suggest to you, by the way, that it's not the case that Gandhi is really the first person who is thinking of nonviolent resistance or of the duty of civil disobedience. Henry David Thoreau, in the 19th century, a great American writer, wrote a little essay called On the Duty of Civil Disobedience. But there is a fundamental difference because, between Thoreau and Gandhi because Thoreau is not thinking of how you would actually use the idea of civil disobedience, right? Or nonviolent resistance, how you would use it as a form of resistance to a colonial state and how you would in fact bring in the masses into it. Thoreau is simply concerned with the idea of your individual conscience. If your individual conscience tells you, as it told him, that you should not be paying taxes to the United States government, which is a position he took in the 19th century, right? Because he thought these taxes were being used to wage an illegal war against Mexico, right? I mean, if you read the essay, he's very clear about why he thinks the idea of the individual conscience should reign supreme over any law that the state might stipulate. But he's not thinking of resistance in the collective. And Gandhi is going to create an entire language of nonviolent resistance. Okay, and then going to be sustained campaigns. So this is what distinguishes Gandhi from his predecessors. Right? Now he's going to wage this struggle in South Africa. Um, different scholars have come to different assessments, you know, whether he did so with mixed results, right? whether he did so with no result at all. Uh, what is certainly very clear is that there were certain kinds of laws and stipulations which adversely affected the Indians and some of these laws were pushed back. For example, under South African law, Indian marriages were not considered valid. So in effect, right, all Indian marriages were illegal. Right? And one of the things that Gandhi was, did very much was to in fact intercede in these disputes and be able to apply pressure on the British government. Right? Now Gandhi is going to leave South Africa in 1914. Right? And he's going to arrive back in India in early 1915. In the meantime, something calamitous has happened in world history, and that is the advent of World War I. Right? You have to bear that in mind in order to understand some of Gandhi's positions at this juncture. And one thing I'm going to urge you to keep in mind is that the Gandhi who thinks something in 1890 or 1900 or 1910 is not the same Gandhi, obviously, that we're talking about in 1920, 1930, and thereafter. Right? So for example, at this juncture, Gandhi takes the view that Indians ought to take part in the war, not, of course, in the capacity of soldiers, he's, he's, since he's got a principled opposition to the use of violence in any form, but that if Indians claim rights as subjects of the British Empire, if they do so, then they must also exercise certain kinds of responsibilities. They have certain duties to the British Empire if they're going to claim rights. Because of course he, he is claiming rights, equal rights, within the British Empire as a subject of the British. Right? So Gandhi in fact is actually going to raise an ambulance corps when he comes back to India. He did that in South Africa too during the Boer War. He actually worked, as an ambul he, he worked in the ambulance corps as somebody who was carrying stretchers to the battlefield, bringing back the wounded. Right? And he's going to, in fact, actively try to recruit people for the war, a position that he's going to completely renounce some years later. And one thing that's really striking, and again, it's a commentary on what it means to be a subjugated people and a subjugated state, that this was not a war that involved India. I mean, this is a classic instance of a war between European powers. Right? And if you, in fact, if you read A.G.P. Taylor, you know, who's got one particular school of you know, interpretation on this matter. I mean, he's very clear that these World War I, World War II, what these are, are these are, a, in a sense, a continuation of the supremacy, of the contest for supremacy that had been taking place in Europe over a very long period of time. Why we call them world wars and so on and so forth is, is another matter. The critical thing is that India will get involved in the war because when Britain goes to war, India being a colony, India is automatically declared to be at war, right, with Germany. The same thing is going to happen in World War II. In World War I, over 60,000 Indians lost their lives. And you have to understand the anomaly of this, the irony of it, considering the fact that India itself was not an independent country, right? It's fighting a war 
you know, for what? For freedom, for democracy, for liberty, but whose liberty? Whose freedom? Right? This is a question that's going to come up because of the enormous sacrifice that was made by Indians in World War I. Most of these soldiers, by the way, who lost their lives, this is, in fact, actually in West Asia, in what is today called the Middle East. Right? All right? So Gandhi is, comes back, he imme immediately, as I said, starts to campaign for the British, but there is a second front that he opens up. He is going to be approached by a number of people to say, would he be willing to intercede on their behalf? For example, a group of peasants in a place called Champaran in Bihar, right, who were growing indigo and they were really suffering immensely as a consequence of their relationship with the management, right? They're, not, they're getting the raw end of the deal, to put it very briefly, okay? So what Gandhi is going to do, remember when he's come back from South Africa, he's spent a good deal of his life outside India. He's not really a known entity. He's not completely unknown because the struggles that he waged on behalf of the rights of Indians in South Africa, these had earned him some mileage. There were people in India who knew him and he had come back to India occasionally, right? But nonetheless, he's not really what you would call a well-known figure at this point in time. So what he has to do is he has to, in fact, develop okay, a constituency, right? a massive constituency. And this is what he's going to proceed to do in the course of the next four or five years. So successfully does he do it. And I think that, in fact, in some ways, it's still an unexplained mystery. I mean, there are hundreds of scholars who have racked their minds on this question. You know, how did Gandhi come back from South Africa in the midst of a nationalist movement when there are people like Tilak, who had mentioned to you last time, who are people who have a nationwide reputation, right? It's not like India is a blank field. There's nobody working there that Gandhi is the first nationalist. No, there's a well-developed nationalist movement already. And the mystery is that Gandhi, who's a relatively unknown entity, comes back to India after having spent the greater part of his life overseas and within five years will become the undisputed leader of the Indian National Congress and the Indian Nationalist Movement. Okay? The Congress party, which used to have a membership of two, three, four thousand, is going to be transformed into a mass organization with membership running into a few millions, okay? under the leadership of Gandhi. Now, before I continue with the rest of his life, let me just mention very briefly a little book that he wrote when he was still living in South Africa. This book is called Hind Swaraj. Right? I think of it as the equivalent of the Communist Manifesto with respect to what a little pamphlet, which is what the Communist Manifesto by Marx and Engels was, what it really achieve, could achieve, what its significance is. Okay, Indian Hind Swaraj has a subtitle, Indian Home Rule. Hind Swaraj or Indian Home Rule, the word Swaraj, you notice that I had mentioned to you the word Swadeshi, Last time, the Swadeshi movement, same prefix. So Swa means one's own, Ru, Raj means rule, one's own rule. Except that Gandhi means one's own rule, the word Swaraj in two ways. Not only do we Indians want to be free from the British, we want to rule over ourselves. That's one meaning. The second meaning, which is critical for Gandhi, is that everybody has to rule over themselves. That is that there is always a struggle within every human being between, let's put it very colloquially, the forces of good and the forces of evil. Right? You have to take, you have to struggle to take possession over yourself. So when Gandhi makes an argument in Hind Suraj, he's saying not only do we want to be free of the British, we have to first liberate ourselves. We have to free ourselves from our baser instincts, from our animal instincts, if we are going to rise to a level capable of achieving independence. Right? Because for him, the question is, why is it that Indians fell under colonial rule? And he says they fell under colonial rule partly because we were tantalized by the materialism, the technological progress of the West the technological advancements of the West. The glitter of Western civilization seduced us, right? This is what he's going to argue in Hind Swaraj. So Hind Swaraj is in fact actually 
a devastating indictment of industrial modernity. That's what it is. And when you read this book, you're going to say, oh man, this man's a complete nutcase, right? Because there's chapters here which are critiques of lawyers, right? Modern medicine. And you know, one shouldn't think that Gandhi was somebody who was hearkening back to the, you know, the bullock cart, the age of the bullock cart, which is how he's sometimes represented. He has a critique of modernity and he's trying to understand how is it that modernity alters social relations, human relations. Okay, that's what Hind Swaraj is fundamentally about, but it's also a plea for autonomy, for self-reliance. All right, so now Hind Swaraj is written in 1909. It gives you Gandhi's worldview, a worldview which is not going to be congruent with the worldview of all the other Indian nationalists that we have, because most of the other Indian nationalists are very clear that whatever it takes to achieve independence will be done. If it means following Gandhi and his practices of nonviolent resistance, we will follow him. So for the rest of the Congress leadership and for the masses in India, following Gandhi didn't necessarily mean that you adhered to his views about right, nonviolent resistance and how productive these views might be. What it really meant was that this is a policy, if the policy is productive in taking us towards independence, we will follow it. If it's not productive, we will jettison it. Right? They did not have the kind of philosophical commitment, of course, to the idea of nonviolent resistance that Gandhi himself had. Now, at the end of World War I, the British, the Indians have an expectation that because they've taken part in the war, that they are going to be given certain kinds of liberties. Right? They're going to be rewarded for their war effort. In fact, what the British are going to do is they're going to pass an act. It's called the Rowlett Act. If you look at the board on the extreme right over there, Right? And what the Rowlett Act is going to do very briefly is going to allow the British to detain Indians without a trial for indefinite periods of time. So it's a suspension of the right, of the right to habeas corpus and so on. It's a suspension of constitutional safeguards. What Gandhi is going to do is he's going to call for a movement of resistance to what he sees as this form of iniquity. And just as he's sort of contemplating what the prospects are, how he should do it. There's going to be a massacre that's going to take place in April 1919. It's called the Jallianwala Bagh massacre, again on the extreme right of the board over there, in the city of Amritsar, right? In the vicinity of the Golden Temple, right? Very close to the Golden Temple, literally about a kilometer from the Golden Temple, right? And this is called the Jallianwala Bagh massacre. The Jallianwala Bagh is this enclosed area, and the British are going to take troops there. There's a meeting going on of Indians, right? General Dyer, who is the officer in commanding, he has issued an order saying that political meetings may not be held. The meeting will still be held. It has only one entrance. You can go to the Jallianwala Bagh today and see it, right? And they've preserved all the places on the walls where you've got the bullet marks and so on. He takes 50 troops with him, stations them there, and without giving the crowd a warning to disperse, they start firing. They keep on firing until their ammunition runs out. Right? So there are going to be about 400 people who are killed. This is the official count. The unofficial count, which the Indian Ashes give, is much higher. And some people have argued that this was in some ways the end of British rule in India. Right? That this, was, this put an end to all the suppositions that the British were fair, they were inclined to justice, so forth and so on. What is certainly true, without a shadow of a doubt, is that the Jallianwala Bagh massacre is the moment which is going to allow Gandhi, there were other moments too, but this is, the, this is the catalyst, allows him to rise to the position of preeminence that I had mentioned to you a few minutes ago. So he's going to become, as I said, the, the undisputed leader of the Indian nationalist movement, right? And the first movement is going to be called the non-cooperation movement, and it means exactly what the words say. He basically pleads with Indians to refuse to cooperate with the British. Surrender your titles. Stop going to British run schools. Do not use British textiles, British manufactured goods. Okay? Shut the British out of your lives, so to speak. Okay? Not necessarily in their personal capacity as Englishmen or English women. Right? Because one of the most extraordinary things about his life is that at no point in his life did Gandhi lack friends from the West. He always had friends from Europe the United States, the West more generally, right? But what he's saying is that we do not want to cooperate with the institutions and the practices of British rule 
in any shape or form. So this is called the non-cooperation movement. Again, a very long story, which we cut short. The movement is going to go on for about 16, 18 months. In early 1922, Gandhi is going to suspend the movement because in a little town called Chauri Chaura, there is going to be a bout of violence, a ferocious bout of violence where 15, 20 policemen are going to be burnt in the police station by a large crowd of Indians. Gandhi sees it as a very clear sign the country is not yet prepared to offer nonviolent resistance. So he's going to suspend the movement. Very controversial decision. Many of his colleagues are not going to agree with that. Now, when he suspends the movement, the British, who have been waiting for an opportunity to put him on trial on charges of sedition, they are going to put him on trial. That's called the Great Trial of 1922, right? Where Gandhi is going to then issue a statement in court. I mean, if any one of you has seen the film Gandhi by Attenborough, which you know, many people have different views about it, particularly the scholars, but it has a good representation of this particular scene. Because one of the most unusual things about the scene, about this trial, is that of course Gandhi appears in court and says, well, I'm guilty. Not only am I guilty, but you should give me the highest possible sentence that you can, right? And the judge rises. And we have a written record. The judge rises in deference to Gandhi saying that, well, look, you're in a class of prisoners that you know, which is unique. I don't think I'm ever going to encounter anybody like you, but unfortunately, I'm a judge. I have to go by the law. You bro broke the law, and I'm going to have to give you a six-year sentence. In his speech, Gandhi is going to describe how he transforms from being a cooperator to a non-cooperator, right? Masterpiece of English prose, and demonstrates his mastery over the courtroom. All right, that's what this speech is, 1922. Now, Gandhi is sentenced to six years. He's going to be released after three years, partly on, partly on the grounds that he's in poor health, partly because what else would you expect? After all, this is the Mahatma, good behavior. You know, you get a shorter term sentence for good behavior. So he's going to be released in 1925. Over the next few years, he's going to work on what is called the constructive program. The constructive program is a platform which has many different ingredients. How do we effect a social revolution in our country? Right? Women do not have equal rights. The Dalits do not have equal rights. In fact, the Dalits, far from having equal rights, are greatly oppressed. This is the people who are the Shudras. Right? How do we sustain the village economy? Remember that India's share of the world economy has fallen dramatically from something like 23% to something like 1%, right? How do we revive this economy? How do we make people self-reliant? This is what the constructive program is. It's got a long, you know, large number of elements to it. And again, what is interesting about Gandhi is that he is really the only nationalist who takes the view that it is not enough to get political emancipation. We have to demand social, cultural, economic rights and struggle for them. Those struggles have to take place alongside the political struggle. Because many of the nationalists are saying, well, you know, you sh really shouldn't worry about that. We will straighten out our problems. We will resolve the conflicts in our society once we have achieved independence from the British. Let's not, you know, split the focus. Gandhi is saying, no, these struggles have to go take place simultaneously. All right. So this is what is called the constructive program. Gandhi is looking for a way to wage the next campaign against the British. This is what's going to lead to what is called the Salt March. In 1930, he writes a letter to Lord Irvin, the British Viceroy, saying that there is a salt law. The British have a monopoly on the production, distribution, sale of salt. Salt is an essential commodity. It's too expensive for Indians. Everybody needs salt. You need to change the law because this law is unjust. If you cannot see your way to having a dialogue with me on this question, I am going to march to the sea and I'm going to break the salt law. Right? That's what the salt march is. Right? I mean, and it's a small gesture, but it galvanizes a country. And again, this is one of those moments because there's going to be international press from all over the country. One of the things that Gandhi understands is that in order to wage a success, successful non-violent campaign, you have to be able to use the media, as it's called. Okay? Publicity is the oxygen of a mass campaign of nonviolent resistance. 
Now, a consequence of this salt march is that Gandhi is going to be invited to London for what is called the Round Table Conference. In effect, this is the first recognition by the British that the game is over. That, you know, now the time is limited. At some point, we are going to have to relinquish our rule. Right? And there's an extraordinary story, and it's not an apocryphal story. There's plenty of documentation for it that when Gandhi goes to London, he's going to, have, he's going to be invited to have tea with the king emperor. The king, right? And Gandhi goes in his loincloth. You know, I very often say that Gandhi started his life, adult life, vastly overdressed. If you read his autobiography, it tells you about, you know, he was trying to emulate the Englishman. He ended his life vastly underdressed, right? And when he goes to Buckingham Palace to have tea with the king emperor, he's wearing a loincloth. And somebody taps him on the shoulder, the journalist, as he's walking up the steps and says, do you, Mr. Gandhi, propose going to see the king emperor dressed in this fashion? And he says, I think the king emperor is wearing enough for both of us. Right? Okay, now, so there's this interesting exchanges. The long and short of it is that this is the moment when the British understand that their rule is essentially over. It's going to drag on now for many more years to come, 15 odd years to come, right? Through the 1930s. And Gandhi will eventually have to wage another struggle, which is called the Quit India Movement of 1942 before independence will be achieved. Now it is not possible for me to describe for you obviously the immense negotiations that went into what became the talks for independence. Okay, and who the other players were. What is important to remember is that by the early 20th century when the Indian National Congress is becoming supreme, the British begin to realize that one effective way of trying to counter this nationalist movement is to split it. And this is where you have to use the old theory of divide and rule. They are going to encourage the Muslims, especially, to create their own political party and are going to argue to the Muslims that under Hindu rule, you would be oppressed by the majority. Your best bet is to let us continue, essentially. So the Muslim League is going to be founded in 1909 with the explicit encouragement of the British. Again, plenty of archival documentation about that. Right? With the argument that, well, your interests, they're telling the Muslims, are not really represented by the Indian National Congress. We represent you better than the Indian National Congress can represent. And for various historical circumstances, this argument is not really going to be very persuasive to the Muslim League throughout the 1910s, 1920s, 1930s. But it is by the late 1930s that the Muslim League is now going to begin to voice the demand for a separate nation state, which is going to be the preserve of Muslims. Right? And so when World War II ends in 1945, there are going to be these negotiations for Indian independence, but there's going to be a demand by the Muslim League, which claims to now represent Muslims. And remember that Muslims in undivided India would have accounted for one fourth of the population roughly 25% of the population. So that's a very sizable group of people. And eventually the demand will be for a separate nation state, which is a demand that will be conceded with consequences that we are living with up to the present day. If you know anything about the hostilities between India and Pakistan over the course of the last right, seven decades. So this is going to be Pakistan. This is the western wing of Pakistan. This is going to be the eastern wing of Pakistan. It's called East Pakistan. And in 1971, it will break away and become Bangladesh. Right? And why is the division done that way? Because the bulk of the Muslims are over here and the bulk of the Muslims are here. Of course, there are Muslims scattered all over. Hyderabad is a city with large number of Muslims. Lucknow is a city with large number of Muslims. Right? So there are all these problems. But nonetheless, what they do is they take the two provinces where you have huge numbers of Muslims and there's going to be a transfer of populations, a transfer of populations. And I mentioned in this class that they're going to invite this person from Scotland, Sir Cyril Radcliffe, who had absolutely no knowledge of India, had never been to India, had no interest in India whatsoever, right? But he is going to be brought over and he is going to be made the chairman of what is called the Boundary Commission. Because when you're going to create a new nation state, you have to create boundaries. Okay? 
the, the Boundary Commission will make a determination both on the Eastern and the Western Front. There's going to be a huge transfer of populations, the single largest transfer of populations in history. Talking about roughly 10 to 15 million people who are going to move across borders. The Muslims who get left behind on this side of the border are going to move to Pakistan. The Hindus, right, I'm talking about the, the Western Front, the Punjab. The Hindus who get left behind in what is called Pakistan are going to move to India. And you're going to have the same thing happening on the Eastern Front. There are about roughly 750,000, 1 million Indians who are going to be killed during this transfer of populations. All right? So this is, of course, again, you have to take your mind back to communalism, right? The idea that, well, Muslims and Hindus are separate nations. They don't really have a shared past, right? This is the outcome of the communalist interpretation. Now Gandhi, independence comes on 15th August 1947. Gandhi is going to be assassinated on 30th January 1948 by an orthodox Hindu, a militant Hindu, who believes that Gandhi in fact is too friendly to the Muslims. The assassination again is an extraordinarily complex matter, you know, but, but it's important to understand that his assassin, as I said, is a person who claims membership in Hindu militant groups, right? And feels that Gandhi has betrayed his own community. Now, I just want to take a few minutes to describe to you, okay, uh, some things that you might want to think about in the history of India in the post-1947 period, and then I'll offer three concluding remarks, okay? In the period post-1947, the country is led by a man called Jawaharlal Nehru, right? who's the Prime Minister of India from 1947 to 1964, right? And Nehru is somebody who very much has a liberal kind of sensibility, believes himself to be a socialist, is staunchly committed to the idea of a secular India, right? A secular India, because remember that many Muslims are going to stay behind, and India, of course, has a large population of not only Hindus, but Muslims, Sikhs, then you've got Parsis, Jains, and there's been a revival of Buddhism in recent years. All right? So Nehru is staunchly committed to that. He's also committed to socialist planning. The general view is that, that India as an economy did not do well. I'm not going to get into the, the intricacies of that argument, but that's a general view, that India did not do well under him with respect to the question of economic growth. But that in a sea of dictatorships and totalitarian states and many of the formerly colonized countries that attained independence veered in that direction, India remained singularly distinct. Right? Whether the experiment in democracy has been entirely successful or not is again a question that one can dispute and quarrel over. There are conflicting views on that. But India has held a dozen national elections and you know when you hold an election and you've got a population of 1.2 billion it is not a simple exercise all right it is an extraordinary exercise of state machinery required to hold free elections in a country such as india and they've been able to do it consistently okay so there are things of that kind that i think we have to mention all right now that is one aspect of the story. You know, how one looks at essentially India's economic progress and so forth. I mean, the view today is that, well, you know, there's, you know, the, the BJP, the Bhartiya Janta Party, that's a Hindu nationalist party, they had the view which they tried to promulgate through a slogan called India Shining. Some of you may have heard of the slogan India Shining, that India, you know, is becoming an economic powerhouse uh, in the manner in which China is, of course, not to the same degree that China is. There is a school of thought which argues that India and China are going to be restored to the position that they once occupied in the world economy and in world history, right? Uh, be, let's say before 1750, right? Uh, again, I don't think that, you know, we have really the time to look into this in any detail. Uh, and I myself have some degree of skepticism about these claims. I'm also wondering why these claims are viewed as so important by Indians, right? I mean, what does it mean to become a great power? So you, uh, you become a nuclear power, well, is that something that is really necessarily creditworthy to a country, right? 
because that's what India became in 1997, a nuclear power, right? Now there is a whole bunch of people in India. If you numerically put them together, they constitute the vast majority of the population of India who clearly still are suffering under some kinds of disabilities. Women, Dalits, right? The, those who are at the rock bottom of the caste system. In 2006, the Indian government re released a massive report called the Sanchar Committee Report, which looks at the positions of Muslim, Muslims in India. Now, I think that clearly th th there are avenues for Muslims in India as there are for them elsewhere. Right? But nonetheless, there is no question that on the whole, the Muslim community fares less well, is not doing as well as the Hindu community is doing, on the whole. Right? Then there's a serious discussion and debate in India on what kind of reservations should we have. You know, what you call affirmative action in the US, which is really minuscule compared to what they have in India. I mean, in some states, the reservations or the quotas extend to 75%. Because you're speaking about, as I said, if you put all the women, all the Muslims, all the Dalits together, all the, dis all the communities that in some sense or the other do not yet have an opportunity right, to rise to the top in some ways. Right, that constitutes a substantial portion of India's population. So I think that when we're trying to assess well, where India has been heading, how far it's been successful in trying to ameliorate social grievances, I think the results there are greatly mixed. And in some respects, one can actually speak of two Indias. You know, that there, has, there is a divide between those who are the haves and those who are the have-nots. And some people would argue, with some justification, I think, that the liberalization of the economy, which commenced in 1991 under Manmohan Singh, who was then the finance minister and has now been for the last eight odd years the prime minister of India, that this new liberalization of India's economy, which commenced in 1991, has aggravated the economic divide between the haves and the have-nots. I think there's some compelling evidence for this. There is, however, also compelling evidence for the fact that the Indian middle class has grown quite substantially. Okay? Middle class, of course, is a sociological concept that is not particularly useful, I think, in some ways, because it's a very elastic concept. Right? And somehow we can go anywhere from 100 to 350 million people if we're thinking of the middle class. Right? So if you, if you take the lower end of it, well, that's still less than 10% of the population of India. But if you take the higher end of it, right, and you look at rates of consumption, then we're talking about perhaps a quarter of the population of India. All right? So let me now, in conclusion, just mention three things to you. Okay? The first is that, you know, you have to look back on 5,000 years roughly of Indian history. And I have, I have to tell you, maybe I should have said it at the outset, but I thought it's more interesting to actually say it at the end so that you can think about what it means to study history in this fashion. That one has to think of certain kinds of pedagogic strategies when one is going to attempt this huge canvas, all right, over a very short period of time. Right? And you have to think to yourself, well, what, are, what is it that is really the most critical thing that you could walk away with? Because I think at the end of the day, let's be candid about it, and I can speak from my own experience. I mean, you know, I've read about the Kushans over the years, but it took me many years of reading to remember who they were. And I'm quite certain that most of you three years from now will not remember who they are. You might remember who Mohandas Gandhi is. And you would, because you already know about him before, and you will know something about the Upanishads. But there are all these figures, the Delhi Sultanate, in the long run, what is it going to mean to you, right, to have learned about the Delhi Sultanate? So one thing that we need to think about is, all right, we've got this long time span. What is the critical element of Indian history that perhaps you need to have walked away with? And that, I think, has to do with understanding the immensely different streams of thought and culture that went into the making of Indian civilization,
And what, in my view, is the essentially pluralistic nature of this civilization down to the present day. Now, you could make a comparison, for example, with the United States, since we are here, and the vast majority of you are obviously American citizens, if not all of you, right? That if you look at the US, now you could say that the US is a very multicultural society, right? The immigrant, you know, they say that in the Los Angeles school district, the students represent 140 different languages that in their homes at one point, 140 different languages will, have been, will be spoken. Okay? And you could say that this is extraordinarily diverse. Well, I have a different take on that because one of the things that happens, of course, in the United States is that over a process of two generations, virtually all immigrants lose their native tongue. Right? This has been well documented by scholars who have looked at the nature of immigrants in American society and the nature of immigration and what kind of society develops. There, is, there are tendencies towards homogenization. I mean, the United States is effectively, except of course for certain parts of the West Coast and a few other places, effectively a monolingual society. That is not the case with India. Not even remotely. Right? I mean, you've got Canada, Tamil, Oriya, Bengali, and a host of other languages, each of which has a minimum of 10 million speakers, minimum. There are languages which have 100 million speakers. You should look at the Indian banknote. It gives you the currency, okay? It writes the name, when they write 100 rupees, it's written in 14 languages, even today. You've got enormous diversity, and the country has had to grapple with it in its quest to become a democracy. Okay? The other way to look at this entire exercise is that at the end of the day, I would urge you to think this way. This is the second way I would urge you to think about it. That I don't think it is possible to know your own culture until you know another culture that is very different reasonably well. Okay? If at the end of the day, what you have learned about India makes you re-question what you know and what you assume about the United States, in my view, that would have been a success. That would have, that would have been a goal worthy of achieving. Right? So if you think, for example, you know what pluralism means, and your example is the United States, well then I think you ought to look at the nature of pluralism and ecumenism in India and then see what that might teach us about the substantive nature of these claims about pluralism and ecumenism. All right? That's the first set of considerations. Secondly, it's related to the first point. That I think the great tension in India today, and this is my own particular interpretation, and I developed this argument in a series of essays which I published in a book uh, in about 2003, 2004, the book is called Of Cricket, Guinness and Gandhi, right? You might wonder about the, the apposition of these three terms. I'll let you look into it later on. Of Cricket, Guinness and Gandhi, essays on Indian history and culture. And what I essentially argue there, and it's an argument that I want to place before you, and it's related, related to the first argument, is that in some ways the tension in India today, which is, I think, the most productive tension, and the one that will determine the contours of Indian history in the decades ahead is a tension between the idea of India as a nation state and the idea of India as a civilization. Those are two very different things. As a nation state, India can only be a copy of some other nation state. You know, the nation state does not allow for much manipulation, that form. Nation states have a way of homogenizing their populations, enforcing their borders, creating rituals of sovereignty, right? And creating a nation state is a very bloody affair. It has always been a very bloody affair, historically. Everywhere. But a civilization is a different thing. It's, it's a different entity. It lives with conflict. It learns how to deal with conflict. It doesn't run away from conflict. And it does not simply homogenize the populations. 
Okay, so what I mean by that, I'll give you one simple illustration. You know, when you have a nation state, you have something called a national anthem. The only nation state that I know, that I know of, I mean, maybe this is true of Rwanda, I don't know the histories of all the nation states, but I know the histories of maybe a few dozen, to some extent, the only nation state that I know of which really effectively has three national anthems and none of them in the national language is India. Okay? There's a song called Janaganamana, which is the of so called official national anthem. It's in Sanskrit, right? Which a minuscule, minuscule 0.0001% of the population knows today, right? Imagine having a national anthem in the United States, you know, Star Spangled Banner or whatever it is, right? In some language that nobody knows, okay? Then you have Sare Jahan Se Acha, Hindustan Hamara, which means better than all other nations is this Hindustan, right? It's in Urdu and it's poet. The person who wrote it is now the national poet of Pakistan, India's arch enemy, Okay? And then you have a third called Vande Matram, which was written by Bankim Chandra Chatterjee, and it's partly in Sanskrit and partly in Bengali. Now, we have lived with this kind of pluralism comfortably. Of course, there are Hindu nationalists today who want to produce a new national anthem. It should be in Hindi, they're saying, right? That's what makes a proper nation state. No. What it will do is it will diminish the idea of India that we have had for a very long period of time. This is what it means to be a civilization. You live with this kind of pluralism, okay? And live with it comfortably, all right? And so I think that the idea of the tension between India as a nation state and the, the, the tension of India, which is between the idea of India as a nation state and the idea of India as a civilization, this is, I think, the most critical tension facing India today. And finally, let me take you back to what the Buddha said. Right? So the Buddha said, do not believe in what you have heard. Do not believe in traditions because they have been handed down for many generations. Do not believe anything because it is rumored and spoken of by many. Do not believe merely because the written statement of some old sage is produced. Do not believe conjectures. Do not believe merely in the authority of your teachers and elders. After observation and analysis, when it agrees with reason and it is conducive, don't forget this part, and it is conducive to the good and benefit of one and all, then accept it and live up to it. Okay, and his last words supposedly to Ananda. Ananda was one of his favorite disciples were these. And in essence what I've said before, but it's done quite poetically here. And this is what he says, be the lamp unto yourself. Somebody can only take you as far. You have to then carry the journey yourself. Finish it yourself, okay? Be the lamp unto yourself. That's Swaraj. Okay? Seek shelter of your own conscience. Do not sh seek shelter of others. Listen to your own inner voice. Life is short. Do not waste it. Use it with great care. Be the lamp unto yourself. Personally examine and verify by experience anything that a guru may tell you. All right? So with that, we finish this course, and on Friday, you should come, fill out the evaluations, and there will be a review session. Okay? Thank you.